depression and mania are two ends of the spectrum and they're both destabilizing forces. They try to mess you up and take you off your game. And so establishing consistency and routines can really help to combat that. Basically, what I'm saying is when you're feeling down and unmotivated or you're just having these racing thoughts and agitation, you want some sort of playbook, some sort of rule book. What am I supposed to be doing right now? And that's where the routine comes in. It's not always easy to stick to them when you're feeling those ways. But if you have some sort of guideline there, it helps you understand what your next step should be in any given day and just what to do with yourself. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right, what's up, friends of all varieties? This is the Hardcore Self Help Podcast, episode 142. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I'm doing a QA. Feels good to do a QA today. I, um, you know, been splitting it up with the interviews and all that good stuff. So it's, it's nice. I feel refreshed when I get to do a question and answer. So I do like this balance going back and forth. Uh, last week was Kate Manser's interview. You might die tomorrow. Really good. Lots of awesome feedback about that. Thank you guys so much today. Um, you may hear a little bit of inconsistency in the recording. I'm doing this a little bit differently because I have a very, very busy day. I've been doing a bunch of interviews for the assistant position for Duff the Psych. So I've been doing a bunch of those today and I am currently recording this at about one o'clock PM. My little boy is in the other room. I'm listening for him to make sure he doesn't uh, kill himself or anything like that. So if you hear any child screaming in the background, I'll have to pause and go check that out. But just kind of trying to wedge this in here because I have an interview on another podcast after this. And then I have a live stream for one of my Facebook groups after that and friends coming over over for dinner. So very busy day trying to squeeze it in here. But I have a very, very, very exciting announcement for you guys. At least it's exciting to me. I think it will be for you too. If you like free stuff, it'll be exciting to you. So I would like to start doing a new thing where I give away one of my books, either one, the anxiety book, fuck anxiety or depression. I'm going to give away one of those books to one of you guys every single week that I do a podcast. So for each week, what I would like you to do is share your favorite quote from the podcast from this week's episode of the podcast on social media. You can do this in a variety of ways. You can just write the quote out. You can make a graphic or a video of some kind. Creative stuff is great. Do anything that you'd like, but share your favorite quote from this week's episode and tag me on social media. I'm at Duff the Psych on everything, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. cetera. Um, so tag me in that. And I'm going to go through and pick one person each week who shares a quote from the podcast and send them a free book. Now, there are some limitations to this. Uh, I can send it most places in the world. Unfortunately, Australia does not play well with Amazon in terms of me being able to send copies of my book for free. So Amazon uh, in Australia is not going to work. So I'm not going to be able to send them to Australia. But other places I can, certainly the UK, Canada, etc. If there's a place that pops up and I, I cannot send it there, I'll, I'll try to make it up to you somehow. But um, yeah, unfortunately, Australia is not going to do it. So after this episode's done, you pick out a quote that you like, share it on Facebook, on your Instagram story, on Twitter, wherever. You could even just do a screenshot and put the quote in there, and I'll pick one of you guys and send you a book. All right? So with that, let's go ahead and get into the question and answer. I have three really good questions today, and I'll do my best to give you an awesome answer for it. If you have a question you'd like to send in for the podcast, just send it to DuffThePsych at gmail.com, and I will certainly consider it for a future episode. Okay, so question one reads, Hi Duff, I have a tough situation I'm going through. I was raised with an extreme fundamentalist Christian upbringing. We were taught that makeup, jewelry, trimming hair, dancing, going to the movies, watching most TV shows, etc. were wrong. From youth, I was given the message that I was sinful and going to hell. 
I was the black sheep of the family. I was told that I was rebellious from the beginning as evidenced by my having said no to my mother while covering her mouth. And at age three, when I put my fingers in my ears, wiggled them and made a face at my mom. Through the years, I've tried to let go of the resentment and pain of a lifetime of messages that I'm going to hell, that I'm evil, but I just can't. I'm having to cut off relationships with my mother due to abusive statements. Now I feel like I need to limit my contact with the others too. It hurts like hell and it feels almost like my mother has died and that I'm losing the others as well. How do I deal with any lingering guilt? How do I heal and go on? Thank you. So first off, um, as I'm answering this question, I want you to keep in mind that I am not a religious person. Um, I would consider myself an agnostic, meaning I have no idea. I could be wrong that there, I, I, I'm not assuming that there's no higher power or God. I see no evidence of it, but I just don't know. I don't feel like there's any way that I could possibly know. And it's not a priority for me. And I think that it's possible to have a moral compass and do good things and all the other stuff that comes along with religion without having a religion. I don't necessarily think that religion is bad in every case, though in some cases I do think that negative things come from certain types of religious practices, especially a lot of fundamentalist religious practices. So that's sort of my personal bias going into this. Um, it's going to be different than somebody else's perspective, obviously. But regardless of what faith in particular we're talking about, it's clear that the message you've received personally from a young age is that you're bad, that you're weird, that you probably don't deserve good things, that you don't deserve maybe the love that your family thinks they give you and all of that. Like you're just not worth it. And that's the message you're getting over and over. And honestly, if anybody was treated this way over and over for years and years, they would develop some difficulties because of it. You know, these messages are coming to you when you're young, in your formative periods, during periods where you're very much still establishing your sense of self. And so you're getting these messages over and over while you're establishing your sense of self. How am I supposed to understand myself in relation to others, in relation to the world, in terms of my own um, traits and lifestyle? How am I supposed to consider that? And you're being told, well, you're evil, you're weird, you're the black sheep. So obviously, that's going to cause you to perceive yourself in a way that would not be the case if you didn't have those messages coming in. So when your entire experience is painted with these negative interpretations, it's really easy to internalize the messages that you're getting and make that voice your own, make that negative voice your own. So you talk to yourself in that negative way. One thing that I think could be really helpful for you is to make sure you have some form of support in terms of people that can actually understand and empathize with what you're going through. Like from my perspective, I can offer you some support and ideas, but I don't know what it's like to go through that. And I think that if you were with people or had some contact with people who do understand what it's like to have this sort of fundamentalist upbringing, this uh, fundamentalist Christian upbringing, these, these statements that you feel have been abusive, all this stuff, that might help you out quite a bit just to have that perspective. So the internet, I think, could be a really good tool for you. If you haven't already, using the internet to find those people who have been through what you've been through and to pick their brains about it, to see the stories they tell, stuff like that could make you feel like you're not alone in it and like you're not crazy. Um, a little bit of personal experience. I have a friend of mine, and I'm not going to share too many details, but they essentially escaped from a religious cult and they began writing a blog about their experiences. And what was really interesting is that without any sort of real promotion, the blog gets a lot of traffic online because there are so many people out there just like them who are asking the same questions, you know, Googling things like, is this right? Is this legal? How can I get out? You know, a lot of questions related to fundamentalist upbringings and things that can be a little bit more cult-like. So there are people out there who are looking for the same answers. And so Googling key search terms like maybe fundamentalist recovery, uh, ex-Christian support groups. Uh, there's this, I, I was doing a little bit of searching on my own. There's this site called Living After Faith. It's a blog that seems to have some good resources. I can't personally verify them or vouch for them. But what I'm saying is it's not, you don't have to go far searching online to find some resources, resources that might be helpful to you. I know there are definitely Reddit, Reddit sub, subreddits as well, different groups there that you might be able to reach out to. And again, this is just to help you get some perspective from people who have also been on the other side of things. Basically, you need people to tell you that you aren't crazy, that you have been mistreated, and that they do understand what you're going through. That would be hopefully very, very helpful. And I also want to say that I'm very proud of you for standing up for yourself, for establishing some boundaries with your mother and with your other family members. 
you know, your family called you a rebel and maybe you are, but maybe that's not a bad thing. I think that it could be a good thing. That rebellious spirit that you have might be the only reason that you were able to stand up for yourself to see the truth in the matter and, you know, establish some of these boundaries where you're just not going to take that treatment anymore. So be proud of the fact that you're a rebel because that means that you're not going to be stuck in this forever. You mentioned that it feels like your mother has died. And I think that's a really great point and also totally normal. Like your mother is still alive, but the relationship that you've had with her for a long time, that has died. And you're allowed to have mixed feelings about that, right? So there's going to be a grieving process. There's going to be, there there are going to be lots of different feelings that come up from that. And that's normal. I think a good analogy is, you know, you take somebody who maybe has a physically abusive parent or a parent with severe substance abuse issues, something where they're just not able to be a good parent. And the person in question may not like their parent. They may even hate them. But oftentimes when that parent dies, even if they don't love their parent, it's totally normal for that person still to have a grieving process that will be filled with lots of different things, sadness, anger, confusion, all sorts of different feelings. And so even if you don't like the relationship, grieving it is still something that does happen. So for you, it might be similar, even though you hated the way that you were treated and the relationship that you've had, it's still something that you're used to having in your life. It's something that's been there for a long time. And there might be a period of adjustment to get used to the fact that that relationship is no longer there. That relationship has to die. At least that version of it. That's not to say that you can't have any sort of relationship with your mother. I I don't have any sort of personal Um, leanings to say that you need to have a relationship with her. But if you at some point want to reestablish contact or build a different type of relationship, you certainly can do that if you feel comfortable and safe. But this version of the relationship is going away. And so that's allowed to feel weird. I think it's going to take some time. There very well may be different stages of grief that you go through, and that's okay. You need to be your own advocate, and you need to make sure that you're taking good care of yourself while you adjust to all of this, and you're off to a good start with that. If you're not in therapy, I think that would be a very good idea. I imagine that you probably feel guilty talking about this and bringing it up and trying to deal with these issues since they run so deep, Uh, and I think a therapist is somebody who can be professional. They can maintain confidentiality, and they're never going to judge you for saying things that Other people like your family members would get mad at you for. So it's a safe space to just explore that. I think you probably internalize a lot of those those negative voices, like I said. And so when you have these thoughts about your family, you probably feel guilt associated with that. You feel the things that they would tell you, like you kind of internalize their negative statements about you and apply those to yourself. And so being in therapy is a stage where you can sort of explore that other side of yourself, maybe that more rebellious side of yourself, and and talk about these things in a way where it's going to stay in the room. You're not going to get in trouble for it. It's not going to be shared with anybody. Setting boundaries as you have is a great first step. Uh, So we talked about, you know, setting boundaries, finding support, having some sort of empathy. I think that would be massively important as well. From there, you're using that as a springboard to try to learn how to live your life without considering what your family would think or how your religion would judge you, at least not as much. Sure, it's something you can keep in mind if you want to, but you don't want that to dictate everything that you do in the same way that it has. And that can definitely take time. It's going to take practice. Learning some skills to challenge your negative, possibly self-defeating thoughts through therapy or self-help resources, books, podcasts, whatever, that could serve you very well as you go about practicing this new way of being, really. You're just trying to practice a different way of being in the world. So overall, I absolutely think you're on the right track. Have some patience. The issues that you're talking about have been brewing for a very, very long time, obviously. So they're not going to go away overnight. But I just want to encourage you that, you know, if you keep taking care of yourself, doing what you need to do, focusing on these things that we talked about, I think you're going to be in good shape. All right. So thank you for the awesome question. Okay. So question number two. So I'm a single mom to an 18 month old boy. And I've been struggling with severe clinical depression, severe anxiety, and bipolar 2 disorder since I was 14 years old. Uh, Just an aside to the listeners here, bipolar 2 is the version of bipolar where you don't have full-blown manic phases. You have what are called hypomanic phases. So you may not be staying awake for weeks at a time and really doing super self-destructive activities, but you're going to be elevated. You're going to be agitated. You're going to have a lot of that sort of anxious energy, creative energy to get stuff done and not a good way to direct it. So that's bipolar too. Coming back, um, I used to be on medications, but had to stop when I got pregnant with my son. 
For the past two years, I've had a really hard time coping with parenthood while trying to maintain my mental health. What are your suggestions for young parents struggling with bipolar disorder and depression? So thank you for the question. First off, you're amazing. Uh, being a woman is not easy. Being a mom is not easy. Being a single mom is not easy. And being a single mom with severe psychiatric issues is tough as shit. And as a result, you've had to be tough as shit. You've had to be really tough to get through this. And the fact that you're alive and you're here asking this question is already an accomplishment in my book. So congratulations to you for that. I know you're not happy with where things are, but you're here. And that's, that's very good. I don't know a lot about your situation just from this question, so it's a little unclear to me whether you went off your medication at the advice of your doctor or if that's just sort of what you heard you should do. I want to just let everybody listening know that you don't always have to come off all of your medications when you're pregnant and breastfeeding. Um, there's a lot of fear mongering out there that will tell you that you need to drop everything and you need to not stop doing anything in your life that could potentially be any sort of risk to your child. You need to be this perfect, immaculate vessel for your child. There are multiple ways of thinking about that, you know, from the feminist perspective that raises some issues for me from the medical perspective. It's also just not entirely called for. You're going to want to give your kid the best shot, obviously, but there are many medications that carry realistically very little risk to the child. You also need to consider your own mental health. Are you going to survive the pregnancy without the medication? Are you going to be able to successfully parent a child without the medication? Things like that. To be absolutely clear, this is not medical advice. You need to talk to your doctor about this. There are so many different medications out there. Every, every person's individual situation is different. Some medications, they are not a good idea to have during pregnancy. Other ones, there's very little risk. So if you feel like you're not being heard, definitely get a second opinion. You might be interested to know that my wife, Joelle, who's been on the podcast several times, uh, she stayed on medication throughout her pregnancy for anxiety and bipolar 2 uh, for both of our boys and throughout breastfeeding both of them. They're doing very well right now. She's doing very, very well right now. The pregnancies were not significantly affected by those medications. But again, every person's situation is different. So talk to your doctor about it before making those decisions. Don't let the internet scare you into doing one thing or another. Anyway, off the soapbox, back to the question. Uh, if you're not on medication again, this is always something to consider, especially if your medications really did the trick for you in the past. You know, if you were on a good cocktail of medications and you felt like things were in check before the pregnancy, Maybe consider going back to that. You know, even if you don't want to hit it as hard, maybe starting slow, going on a lower dose of the medications and working your way up, something like that. Of course, again, following your doctor's advice. But um, yeah, definitely medications are something to consider. It sounds like these aren't just life adjustment difficulties you're talking about. You know, you've had significant mental health challenges for years now. You described severe clinical symptoms, and that's something that usually requires treatment, not just self-help. Certainly, you can make differences for yourself with self-help, but treatment is something that's there for people who have a situation like yours where we're, we're talking about psychological disorders. We're not talking about just having stress at the workplace or something like that. Please be gentle on yourself for needing help at this stage in your life. There's so much pressure to be a perfect parent, whatever the hell that means. And it's really easy to beat yourself up when you feel like your mental health difficulties are impacting your ability to parent. It's not selfish to care for yourself. You have to care for yourself. It's absolutely essential, especially if you want to be a good parent. You need to care for yourself. You know, that whole metaphor putting on your your oxygen mask first. It's true. You need to care for yourself. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be able to care for your kid. And regardless of your kid, you are human too, and you deserve to care for yourself. The postpartum period after you have a child can be really tough when it comes to mental health. There are hormonal changes. Your body is totally different than it was before you had a kid. If you're breastfeeding, sometimes that can be a challenge in terms of getting the kid to latch or your sort of bond during that time. And to be honest, babies can just be assholes sometimes. Like, I understand that. I got two young kids. They can be crazy, and that makes things difficult to cope with. So please be gentle on yourself. A lot of the particular advice I would have for you is typical. You know, make sure you have a good support network. Make sure that you're trying to get some time for yourself, maybe even alone, to invest in your own self-care. Simple things, diet, exercise, are you getting enough sleep? What can you do to optimize those? If you have access to therapy and medication management, as we talked about, please take advantage of that. And of course, take in just as much content as you can that's related to the issues you're having. <laughs> Leo's calling me in the background. Uh, yeah, just take in as much information as you can that's related to what you're going through. 
Um, in terms of the parenting and mood disorder interaction you talked about, you know, asking what can parents with bipolar do, I would encourage you to focus a lot on routines and consistency. This is going to be helpful for both you and for your kid. Depression and mania are two ends of the spectrum, and they're both destabilizing forces. They try to mess you up and take you off your game. And so establishing consistency in routines can really help to combat that. Basically, what I'm saying is when you're feeling down and unmotivated or you're just having these racing thoughts and agitation, you want some sort of playbook, some sort of rule book. What am I supposed to be doing right now? And that's where the routine comes in. It's not always easy to stick to them when you're feeling those ways. But if you have some sort of guideline there, it helps you understand what your next step should be in any given day and just what to do with yourself. So you may not have a lot of time on your hands to like take classes and read about self-help and all these different skills that might help you, breathing, cognitive tricks, all this sort of thing. But you do have time to listen to content, obviously, since you're here listening to my audio, uh, my podcast. But one thing you may want to try out is audiobooks. If you haven't yet, there are lots of amazing self-help audiobooks out there that you could listen to while you're, you know, cleaning up the house, while you're driving a car. Filling in those spaces between everything with helpful content, that's going to keep your mind working at this. And eventually, at some point, you'll find a gem that makes a lot of sense to you, and maybe you can apply that to your life. But again, overall, there's no wonder that you've been having a hard time lately. I don't think anybody can blame you for that. I'm glad that you're in this place where you're starting to think about yourself again and wondering what you can do to get back on track. So, you know, in addition to the tips that I gave you, one other thing you can do is go to my website, duffthesite.com, and use the search bar at the top to search for some key terms, and that would help you find other podcast episodes or blog posts that I've written that cover topics like anxiety, bipolar, even parenting with mental illness. Some of the podcast episodes with my wife on might be really helpful for you to listen to. So again, good job in caring for yourself. You're on the right track, as I said with the last question asker but it's time to invest again in caring for yourself. All right, thank you. All right, rounding it out with the last question. It reads, hey, do you have any advice or tips for someone like me who finds it very hard to allow anxiety attacks to wash over them? I find that when I feel that panic, I begin to panic about the panic, and it's all one big nasty circle with me in the middle of it close to tears. This usually hits me at work, and I feel as if I've been reverted back to being a helpless little child. I struggle daily, and if I'm honest, I just wish it wasn't even an issue for me. Thank you for letting me get in touch. Okay, so thank you for the really good question. Um, first off, if you hear additional noise, I brought Leo into the room with me, so he might have some babbling going on as he sits here and eats his cracker and watches Daddy work. But what you're talking about sounds very, very much like panic disorder. Obviously, I'm not here to diagnose you. Couldn't happen from this single question through the podcast and all of that, but what you're describing sounds like it. Uh, according to the DSM, which is our diagnostic manual that we psychologists use, panic disorder is basically when you have frequent, often unexpected panic attacks, and at least one of those panic attacks cause you to have a month or longer of persistent fear of having future attacks. So essentially, the way I like to describe it is it's almost like having a phobia of a panic attack. You're so concerned about having a panic attack that you get so sensitive about it. And in fact, the fear of potentially getting an attack can be so bad that it starts its own panic attack. So it is this sort of cycle like you described, the circle with you in the middle. And it can suck. It's really tough to deal with. It can be inconvenient and embarrassing. And it's super easy for it to build up to this just really big fear that you have in your head of potentially having a panic attack. The good news is that panic disorder is treatable. The research shows that with the right tools and the right type of work, you can stop having such frequent panic attacks and lessen the severity of them when they do occur. Fundamentally, anxiety symptoms are not the issue here. It's much more about your reaction and interpretation of them. As you might already know, one of the most helpful components to any successful anxiety intervention is exposure. I've talked about that so many times on the podcast. Exposure, exposure, exposure. It's important. You need to build a better tolerance for feelings of anxiety and the fears that come along with your panic. Because right now, you're preoccupied with worries about potentially panicking sometime in the future, which makes you more sensitized. So if we can lower that threshold, make you less sensitive to it, it's gonna be a bit easier to deal with. This is predictable, but therapy is one of the best ways to do that. There are certainly things you could do on your own as well, but if you have cognitive behavioral therapists in your area that specialize in anxiety disorders, this would be an easy case for them. You could probably make some big improvements rather quickly. You know, we're talking a matter of weeks or months here. So 
that's something that you could definitely look into if you have the resources available to you. But when we talk about exposure, there are different elements to it. Uh, one of the most effective things you can do is get exposure to the internal sensations that come along with panic. Right now, it sounds like when your body starts to feel a little bit off, whether that's dizziness or muscle tension, lightheadedness, etc. Yeah, I know. Your brain goes, holy shit, it's time to panic. Oh my God, like, let's take this and run with it. Now, to stop your brain from overinterpreting like that, you could get some practice at actually coping with those feelings, at coping with those physical sensations. At home, you could do some exercises to basically stimulate the experience of panic, or in some cases, even start a panic attack. Remember, panic attacks aren't going to hurt you. Panic attacks can't hurt you on their own. That's not how it works. Nobody dies from panic attacks. It makes you feel really bad, and it can feel a lot like a heart attack or something like that. But as long as you are medically healthy otherwise, you're not going to actually be hurt by the panic. At least in the short term, you know, if you have panic across your life for, you know, 45 years, are you going to have more problematic aging? Probably, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, you know, having panic attacks one at a time on, you know, the, the order of weeks or months. So, you know, if you simulate a panic attack and you actually end up getting one, that's okay. If you're in your home, if you're in a safe place, nothing bad's going to happen to you. And you could do this in a variety of ways. Um, certainly, there are workbooks that describe this in detail, like the Cognitive Behavioral Workbook for Anxiety. But things like running in place, uh, breathing through a straw so you have a very, very small opening, spinning in an office chair, things that basically throw you off and make you feel not normal. Those things can help you kind of simulate the feelings that come along with a panic attack. Another one would be like breathing into a bag, hyperventilating to feel lightheaded, stuff like that. Obviously, talk to your doctor before engaging in these activities to make sure it would be safe for you to do so because there can be complications that come if you're <laughs> having other medical issues in the mix. So just be smart about that. But in general, this is actually a very common technique to help you get experience with the feelings that come along with anxiety. And basically, when you invite these sensations in, it's different. Usually you avoid them. Usually you push them away as, as hard as you can. But when you invite the sensations in, it helps to take away their sting. It helps them not have so much power over you. And it helps you teach your body that you don't actually have anything to fear when you start to have some sort of anxious sensation. It's, it's okay. It's just a feeling like all of your other feelings. So there's a whole protocol for going through the anxiety exposure hierarchy step by step. Uh, I talked about the cognitive behavioral workbook for anxiety. That's a great one. My online course, Kick Anxiety's Ass, which you can find at kickanxietycourse.com. That's a really good resource as well. I walk you through step-by-step -step how to make a hierarchy. I also teach you like essential coping skills like breathing strategies and you know thinking skills that you can use to not get so worked up by your anxiety. So that would be a great resource. But there are lots of things out there that can help you understand how to go about reducing that sensitivity. Obviously, medication may also be an option. Uh, you can meet with a psychiatrist and have an evaluation, which is where they would talk to you about what you're going through, what your symptoms are, and see if it makes any sense for you to start medication. You could have medication like an SSRI that would lower your overall baseline level of anxiety and reactivity, or like a sedating medication, something like Xanax, that might be appropriate for those really intense moments where you just need to take the edge off, and that could help you function. Uh, there may also be some thinking elements to this, like catastrophic thoughts about the whole situation. It's very, very common to overestimate the possibility of threats when you have anxiety, overestimate how likely it is that a threat is going to occur. And then on the other side, we also underestimate our ability to cope with them. So we think it's very likely something bad's going to happen. And when that happens, we're, we're not going to be able to do anything about it. Not really how it is. There's always options. So, you know, when you're at home and more level-headed, it may help to write yourself some little reminder cards, some little note cards. And what you might want to do is put your common reaction to a certain stressor. And then on the flip side, put your logical reinterpretation of that. So when you're in your more level-headed state, how do you go about understanding the situation versus your normal stress reaction? So, for example, maybe you're on one side of the card, it says, when I get to work immediately, I feel flushed in the face and like I need to run to my desk before I start panicking and somebody sees me. On the back of that card, you would write your sort of rational response to that. And this is all hypothetical, but maybe you write, honestly, nobody's ever told me that I look red in the face. I've had very few panic attacks that were so bad that I had to stop what I was doing. Nobody's ever pointed out to me that I looked like I was stressed or something like that. 
You could also write some options for coping. Maybe you could show up 15 minutes early and let yourself work out some of the panic in the car before you even get into the office, for instance, just as one example. But yeah, so variety of things that you could do here. And overall, you just want to try to hone in on the aspects that are the ones causing you issues. So is it a certain person? Is it something about the work environment? A certain physical sensation? A certain thought pattern? You know, things like that. Uh, a journal would be really helpful in terms of keeping track, writing in each day about what your anxiety was like, when you had a panic attack, what the situation was. That can help you pull out those essential pieces. And from there, you can just further narrow your focus and your approach to either self-help or professional help. But yeah, I think you're, you're a pretty textbook case here that looks very similar to panic disorder. It sucks, but there's a lot that you can do about it. It just does take some work. You got to work at it. And having a professional guide you through that is going to be the easiest way. But there are certainly other ways that you can go about getting some help as well. So thank you for the question. And that, my friends, is the end of this episode. I know that there was a lot more cooing and babbling in the background from my coworker here. Say hi, Leo. He doesn't want to say hi. He's going to say hi as I start talking again. Um, so thank you for, for sitting with that. This, this week is very busy, as I mentioned. Um, if you like the show, please write a review, share it with your friends. If you're interested in getting a free book from me, please share your most uh, appreciated favorite quote from this episode on social media. Tag me and I'll pick one of you guys to send a book out to. And uh, I will see you next week with an interview. All right. Take care of yourselves.